Hi, everyone. I think, uh, I think we'll start now, and then uh, there's people who join in. Uh, that'll be fine as well. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the, the State of Global Vaccine Distribution, which is an event which is co-hosted by the Institute for Global Leadership student groups, including uh, Tufts Latin American Committee, uh, Tufts European Horizons, uh, the South Asian Regional Committee, and the Middle East Research Group. Um, so the Institute for Global Leadership at Tufts uh, supports 28 programs, such as coursework, student groups, internship experiences to develop future generations of effective and ethical leaders. And we would like to thank the IGL for their support in putting together this webinar. Um, so we're extremely thrilled to bring you to a conversation with uh, Gavin Yamey, uh, the director of the Center for Policy Impact in Global Health and a professor at Duke University. Um, this discussion will be about the tailwinds and headwinds, uh, headwinds facing global inoculation against COVID-19. So I'll start by giving a very uh, brief introduction of our speaker before we start. Uh, so Gavin Yamey um, is trained in clinical medicine at Oxford University and University College London, um, as well as medical journalism at the BMJ and public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, he was deputy editor of the Western Journal of Medicine, as assistant editor at the BMJ, a founding senior editor of PLOS Medicine, and the principal investigator on a $1.1 million grant, a $1.1 million grant uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to support the launch of a PLOS neglected tropical disease program. In 2009, he was awarded a Kaiser Family Mini Media Fellowship in Global Health Reporting to examine the barriers to scaling up low-cost, low-tech health tools in Sudan, Uganda, and Kenya. Uh, Dr. Yemi uh, serves on two international health commissions, the Lancet Commission on Investing in Health and the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery. He has been an external advisor to the WHO, and to TDR, the Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases. Dr. Yemi has published extensively on global health, neglected diseases, health policy, and disparities in health, and has been a frequent commentator on NPR. Uh, before joining Duke, Dr. Yemi led the evidence to evidence to policy initiative in the Global Health Group at the University of California, San Francisco, and was an associate professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at the U, uh, University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. So I'll, I'll now pass it on to you, Professor, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Yemi, and we very much look forward to your, to your thoughts today and to having a great discussion. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, thank you, uh, Gavin. I guess I'll, I'll take it from here. Uh, first of all, let's just reiterate uh, how excited we are to have you here. We know that our audience has a couple of questions, so I'll go ahead and plug in that if anyone has any questions, be they regional or global to ask, please feel free to use the Q&A function uh, as we will have a designated portion at the end of the event to uh, kind of ask uh, Gavin directly. So Gavin, one of the things that you kind of focus on uh, pertaining to global distribution, something that we saw specifically in your Twitter, uh, is your interest in uh, vaccine or, or pandemic preparedness. So, and that's kind of where we want to start the conversation. Yeah. Now, two, two years before the COVID-19 pandemic, you warned that we must be prepared for such a catastrophe. What were the main factors that led to your prediction and which countries were the most prepared and unprepared? Additionally, what does preparedness entail, be it ready to manufacture vaccines, yeah. fund research and development, increase hospital beds, PPE storage, et cetera? Thanks, Patrick. It's a great question. So maybe I'll start with what it means to be prepared. And the way to the way that I would look at it is to say that there's kind of two major planks of preparedness. There is the national plank, which of course includes subnational regions. You know, some countries are quite devolved to provinces or states, but there's a national plank, and then there's a global plank. And the national plank includes functions such as surveillance. Um, ability to communicate with the public, uh, workers who understand and are ready, testing capacity, all of those pieces. And then at the global plank, by, by, by which I mean going beyond the boundaries of individual nation states. So at the sort of regional and global level, there's a whole host of activities that are needed for preparedness, regional surveillance, global surveillance, research and development for pandemic and epidemic vaccines, vaccine stockpiles, surge manufacturing capacity. Now, after Ebola, West Africa Ebola 2014 to 2016, there was a realization that 
we had done quite poorly at being prepared. And there was actually quite a flurry of activity and the launch of all sorts of very valuable initiatives. Um, for example, the Africa CDC, uh, the WHO's Contingency Fund for Health Emergencies, the launch of CEPI, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, the public-private partnership in Norway that finances pandemic vaccines. So there were a whole host of these and many other things. There are a whole host of these activities. The problem is that whilst there was a little surge, a kind of a sugar rush, if you like, of financing, external developmental financing, aid, whatever you want to call it, for pandemic preparedness after Ebola, that financing was not maintained. We have what are called these cycles of panic and then neglect. During the panic phase, Ebola, you know, the international community rallies and spends more money. And then when the, when the panic is over, when the epidemic subsides and the, and the sort of disease is out of sight, out of mind, then the spending falls. And actually our center, the Center for Policy Impact and Global Health, we did some research showing this, that when there's an emergency, you see greater financing for global public goods for health. In other words, for activities that have these transnational benefits like pandemic preparedness. So then you, you, you see that, you know, the contingency fund for emergencies at the WHO was just struggling to, to raise enough money, even after Ebola. So not very much money was actually forthcoming for, for global pandemic preparedness. And then on the national side, it's very interesting because clearly some countries have done very well at getting ready for pandemics. Uh, some of those countries had experienced other epidemics in the past, SARS, for example, some of these countries had SARS memory, I like to think of it as, you know, the South Koreas and Singapore's and so on. Um, uh, and others didn't do so well, but you will have seen that prior to, this is very interesting, prior to COVID-19, there are a number of scorecards given to countries. One scorecard, the Global Health Security Index, ranked countries going to how well that they were prepared on paper. And of course the US came number one and the UK came number two. On paper, they had systems in place. In practice, of course, those are two of the countries that performed the worst, that mounted the most ineffective responses. And that is in part because, you know, we had Trump and Johnson, and we're also seeing the same with Bolsonaro and Modi, populist men who turned inwards embraced nationalism, rejected multilateralism, uh, rejected science, have been very bad for pandemic response. And these indices didn't capture the sort of the political side. So the last thing I'll say in relation to your question is the piece that I wrote a couple of years before COVID-19 was in response to the Trump administration's plan to cut funding for pandemic preparedness, particularly at CDC, and particularly downgrading activities, CDC support activities in countries with the highest spark risk. In other words, you know, epidemics, pandemics are zoonoses, they jump from species to species, and that's called a spark, that's the epidemic or pandemic spark. Um, and so the CDC was planning to cut funding for a whole host of countries, including, of course, China, uh, and that's why I was raising the alarm. You know, I wrote this piece saying this is not the time to be cutting back on pandemic preparedness. This is the time to be stepping up the gas. And here we are. So it would have cost probably somewhere between three and four billion dollars a year to properly fund pandemic preparedness. And now instead, it's going to cost us, the IMF says, last year alone, 28 trillion dollars in economic loss. So an ounce of uh, prevention would have been tiny compared to the cost of the cure. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that. I mean, it, it's definitely interesting how, despite all of the public health challenges that we've seen only in the 21st century, uh, there still seems to be at the international level kind of a reactionary political culture when it comes to global health. So it's yes. definitely it's definitely something very interesting, uh, which which I guess you know segues into into looking towards the future. Given that this kind of seems to be a cycle of reaction and then uh, uh, I guess failure of preparedness. What do you think this means for future 
pandemic preparedness? Do you think yes. countries will emerge post pandemic with a clear understanding of the importance of anticipating such events, or do you think it'll just keep on being a vicious? I mean, thing? that obviously is uh, is the well, it's the trillion dollar question. It's the multi trillion dollar question. We are in a pandemic era now. We will have more epidemics and pandemics. They've been getting more frequent. I mean, you know that is empirically. Uh, have, has been shown, you know, SARS, MERS, Zika, they, they are becoming more frequent. And on average, we've had one serious pandemic every 100 years. Um, and so, you know, people thought after Ebola, we'd learned the lesson, and we clearly didn't. This has been obviously far more severe. Many of the hardest hit countries were rich countries this time around, and that is almost certainly the reason why we were able to mobilize billions of dollars of funding for vaccine and therapeutic and diagnostic development in ways that we weren't able to before because the rich nations were affected. The question of what it means for, for the future, again, I again I think it has a two-part uh, answer. It's country preparedness and it's global preparedness. And you know, at the country level, systems need to be stronger, surveillance needs to be stronger, early warning systems need to be stronger, health workers need to be ready, et cetera. But then at the global level, I mean, we do have this paradox. Uh, I, I've got strong feelings about this paradox. Um, they're not very popular, uh, but you know, <laughs> you know, you don't you don't come to these conclusions just to be popular. The reality is that if we take this pandemic, we actually did put in place a solidarity mechanism which we had never done before in an outbreak. You know, and if you look at H1N1 2009, we developed a vaccine, rich nations hoarded the vaccine, right? They went into these direct purchase agreements with vaccine manufacturers and they bought more doses and they bought them quicker and less wealthy nations were left behind. This time round, for the first time, we put a pooled solidarity mechanism in place called COVAX. And full disclosure, I was in the working group that gave advice on the design of COVAX. It wasn't perfect. But we absolutely thought that the world would come together around this pooled mechanism. And basically, rich countries bypassed COVAX in the end. They did exactly what happened in 2000. COVAX is a voluntary pooled mechanism. There was no compulsion for rich nations to get involved, and they didn't. And so my unpopular view is that we're going to need a compulsory mechanism for the future. And people tell me I'm crazy. No one's going to do that. But the, I don't see any other. I, just, I don't see an alternative, and I think there has to be some kind of compulsory pooled mechanism that every nation is going to have to fund according to its means, whether it's percentage of GDP, whatever whatever formula one uses, um, and whether it's paid for out of a carbon tax or tax on international financing transactions or whatever it is. I see no future for pandemic preparedness or indeed for any other of these global public goods and services other than a pooled mechanism and a mechanism in which the rules of the road are decided now, right? We've seen horrific vaccine nationalism. We have the most unjust, unethical, dystopian world in which only about 0.3% of all vaccine doses have gone to low-income countries, where rich nations with plentiful doses of, you know, looking forward to a lovely summer, UK, Israel, probably the US, everyone's planning, you know, their trips, trips away, and the rest of the world is on fire. I see, I don't see any other way forward in the future other than some kind of compulsory mechanism that we all agree to now, and we all agree on the rules of the road when it comes to vaccine distribution that is based on principles of equity and, of course, on public health need. And that was the theory that we had behind COVAX, the idea was that through COVAX, the whole world, every single country would get enough doses to vaccinate health workers and high-risk people first. Then, as supply ramped up, doses would go to the general population. That was the idea, with the recognition that that form of equity has to be coupled with public health needs. So there was a, supposed to be a reserve supply five to 10% of all doses that could then get, be directed to where the hotspots are. That never happened because, you know, two, uh, roughly two dozen rich countries bypassed COVAX 
and just went straight to the manufacturer, cleared the shelves. You've got Canada that bought enough doses to vaccinate, you know, every citizen six or, six or seven times over, the US four or five, Britain four or five, and here we are. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot, um, a lot of very relevant points being made there just because, um, you know, that global cooperation, sort of what you were discussing at the beginning, is extremely important, especially when it comes to preparedness, given that individual preparedness can only do so much if you don't have that collective kind of framework established to deal with um, global health crises, which are really irrespective of, of borders, as, as we've but, found out. But some countries did well. Don't forget, one fifth of the world's population lives in nations that have essentially, to all intents and purposes, eliminated SARS-CoV-2. And those nations, they have very few cases or no cases each day. You know, Vietnam, South Korea, Thailand, Singapore, um, uh, Australia, New Zealand, etc. Those nations, first of all, listened to the science, adopted public health science, acted fast, acted aggressively. And secondly, as we said earlier, they had previously experienced an epidemic. And so they, in some ways, they had that memory and they were ready to act fast. You know, so, some places had, had, had run kind of simulations and were ready for, for the next one, or they had reserve capacity, reserve clinics ready for pandemics, et cetera, et cetera. There was, a, you know, there was less, um, less of the politicization of public health measures. You've seen that here in the United States, this horrific politicization, if you wear a mask, you know, that's somehow political. We saw a lot less politicization of public health measures, which I think helped a lot. Leaders were often women. It is scientifically proven that women leaders have done better in this pandemic. Communication was better. You know, they had, they had, you know, you had New Zealand's prime minister, Jacinda Arden, on television many nights, just at home, sitting on her sofa, talking to her citizens, her army of five million and bringing them into the fold. There were a lot, there's a lot that we have to learn from. And one thing that I find very frustrating is that there's these endless Twitter wars from people saying, well, these countries all just got lucky and there's nothing that America could have done. That's just ahistorical and not science-based. It wasn't luck. It was not luck at all. It was preparedness and it was very aggressive action. Right. Yeah. And, and thank you for bringing that gender dimension in, because it is very important. It was something that we uh, wanted to touch upon in the agenda. Um, I do. I want to return to uh, something you mentioned on vaccine nationalism. We actually uh, saw that you tweeted the vaccine, and I quote, the vaccine will have no nationality. It will be a global public good enough with the nationalistic claims, which is something you just reiterated. Um, we wanted to ask, you know, not only the consequences of vaccine nationalism globally, but Many scholars have indicated that vaccines could potentially be used as a new form of public health diplomacy, where donor countries would have ulterior motives, extend vaccine distribution to developing countries in exchange for other unrelated favors, especially when it's outside of the COVAX framework. So I guess the question is, you know, how is vaccine diplomacy or how could it be used as a tool and could this pose a serious problem for uh, developing countries and maybe yeah. the entrenchment of the current sense of systems? So I'm going to do it. I'm going to do a twofer because Oliver Martinez Lopez, um, bienvenidos, it has asked a question, and I'm going to answer that about Covax and yours at the same time because they are linked. Excellent. I would argue to Oliver's point that look, I'm a bit biased. I, I have no financial stake. I wasn't paid as an advisor. It was a, just a voluntary group, but I, I do have a stake in wanting to see multilateralism work. It's, it's had a huge number of problems, obviously. But the idea was that it was supposed to be a multilateral mechanism that avoids some of the problems of bilateralism, right? And, you know, there's now a, a fairly substantial empirical literature of the value of multilateral approaches over bilateral, you know, less politicized, less, less tied aid. Um, and so, the, the idea behind COVAX was that you could participate in two ways. It's true it was voluntary, and, and Oliver asked a very, a very pertinent question on why didn't 
rich countries come on board in the end. The idea was that if you were a wealthy nation, a high income country or an upper middle income country, you would, you would be a so-called self-funded member of COVAX. So you would come on board and you would buy your doses through that mechanism uh, enough to initially vaccinate 20% of your population, the high risk and um, medical workers, but potentially more. And through buying through COVAX, you would support R&D, you would support so-called manufacturing at risk, and you would help to bring prices down for everybody through pooled mass purchasing and therefore help subsidize doses to low middle income countries and lower income countries. So those were the rich self-funded nations. And then all low income and lower middle income countries are automatically members of COVAX. Um, and they, are, they get their doses bought for them through aid, through official development assistance. So the idea there was, and, and is still the plan, I mean, the, the India crisis is, is one of the many threats to this plan because, you know, India was going to be the vaccine maker to the world in many ways. The Serum Institute was one of the sources of doses for COVAX. Um, but the idea was that there would be enough doses, 2 billion doses by the end of the year, enough to vaccinate a billion people, assuming a two-dose regimen which would be enough still to cover about 20% of the population of low income and low middle income countries, high risk people, medical workers. What happened, as I said, is that instead of rich nations doing that, they bypassed COVAX, they went it alone, they cleared the shelf, there wasn't enough doses for COVAX. It actually meant that there weren't enough doses for some of the richer middle income countries to do large bilateral deals. There are some countries that have managed some bilateral deals, Uruguay, Mexico, Chile. I think those are the three with, the, with some of the highest vaccination rates in Latin America. Um, but the rich world got there first. They used their market power. But it is absolutely the case that with COVAX, uh, pushed to the back of the queue with the US essentially deciding to go it alone. And to be honest, even with the Biden administration, full disclosure, I voted for Biden, still really going it alone. I mean, you're not seeing an enormous change in, you know, in, in COVID-19 vaccination policy. They're not sharing doses. I mean, they, they reluctantly now, after a lot of moral suasion, agree to, to, to share some doses, but wow, that was like pulling teeth. There hasn't been a dramatic change in policy on sharing of IP, on sharing of patents, on sharing of know-how. We hear the administration is divided on this topic and there's clearly an internal flaming, there's a real war going on and maybe things will change, I don't know. But so with the US having gone it alone, clearly not interested, uh, in any big way. Again, we keep hearing through the grapevine that there, there may be some big sea change and Biden might be announcing something soon. And all of that we, we have to continue to push for and hope for. Um, that has left China, for example, Russia, for example, that are making their own vaccines, you know, entering into the, the, the space, uh, you know, and, and completely understandably, if, if there's no multilateral mechanism that has the doses, if the US isn't playing its usual PEPFAR-like role or President's Malaria Initiative-like role, which is what a lot of people want, totally understandable. That's quite a long answer to your question, sorry. And so, uh, Gavin, so I have a question very linked to what you are just talking about. So, um, so we wanted to ask you um, about vaccine intellectual property rights. So we know that there's been a lot of countries uh, like, like South Africa and India uh, which have asked to waive um, intellectual yeah. uh, patents and to increase mass production. Yes. Uh, what, is, what is your view on these calls? Um, do you think that would be successful in mobilizing uh, the manufacturing power needed to, to produce more, more vaccines globally, particularly in developing countries? Yeah. And also help address disparities in, in vaccine access internationally? Yes, I think it will. And I think that I am somebody who believes in an all of the above approach. I'm someone who believes that this is a pandemic. 
This is the worst pandemic in 100 years. It is getting worse. Cases have been rising consistently over the last seven to eight weeks. Some countries have had their worst week ever. Um, and uh, the, the, there is an urgency to, to try everything, to open up all the barriers, to, 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 to share patents, to share intellectual property, to share know-how, to do tech transfer, and to urgently globalize the manufacturing of vaccines and therapeutics, but particularly vaccines. You know, vaccines are clearly our way out of this pandemic. You know, it's a cliche that science is our way out, but in this case, reaching close to vaccine herd immunity or achieving vaccine herd immunity is what we are aiming for to, you know, to end these de devastating waves. Um, and so, you know, that, that there is, as you have seen in the last few weeks, this debate about, you know, if you, if you take away patents, you somehow remove the incentive for innovation. I don't buy that. I mean, first of all, of course, huge amounts of public money were used to de-risk what pharma was doing. So these are, these are largely, not entirely, but these are largely publicly invested, public investments that should result in public access to the vaccines. Secondly, if there's any barriers right now, why wouldn't we remove them? I mean, how can you watch what is happening in India or what is happening in Brazil or Iran or Turkey you know, or as we can, as you see now, rising cases in Pakistan and Nepal, and what could become a regional crisis. How can you look at that and not think, whatever the barriers, we need to remove them? Some things matter now. I mean, you know, the most the, breaking the cycles of transmission in India need to happen now. So that's there's an urgent set of things that happen, have to happen. You know, now obviously, from high filtration masks to, you know, targeted circuit breakers, stay at home orders with food and financial assistance, avoidance of crowds, you know, people working from home, all of those things are going to break the cycle of transmission now whilst ramping up vaccination, which is still very slow. At the same time, and the, and, and the urgent vaccination has to include donation. I mean, we it can't be a long-term donation model. India and every other low and middle income country needs to have a sustainable route to making its own vaccine, but that is not gonna happen overnight. There are some facilities that are ready and that could start making vaccines if given the know-how, the technology um, transfer. There are others that would need to be stood up, that would need to be set up de novo from the beginning. Those things are sort of weeks and months but if we are to be in a better place, say by next year, globally, across not just the rich world, which I said, as I said before, is that you know people are high fiving in places like Israel and the UK and the US, and I don't blame them. I, I'm not. I'm not taking. I don't want to take away from people's wonderful joy, vaccine ecstasy in these nations. And I've I've been vaccinated. I'm a beneficiary of that. So is my family in Britain, you know, including health workers in my family. I don't deny. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to say, you know, that I'm, ec I'm ecstatic about that, but isn't that the same kind of protection that we should be providing everybody on the planet? Why is it only the rich that are getting that protection? So we've, we've got to be able to think, what are the urgent things that need to happen now? And then over the next few weeks and over the next few months, and we could be by 2022, you know, we could have the world pretty much self-sufficient in manufacturing vaccines, including mRNA vaccines, if everybody would play ball. So this bizarre business in which the rich nations are hoarding the most vaccines and are also blocking lower middle income countries from making their own vaccines, this notion of rich nations being both hoarders and blockers, it is grotesque. It is one of the most grotesque things imaginable. This is a global crisis. Uh, it's sort of the defining crisis of our era right now. And if we can't, if multilateralism fails us now, I mean, how can we how can we begin to even think about the future at all or other future, you know, multilateral challenges from climate change to antimicrobial resistance to all of these other challenges? It's a, we're, we're, multilateral is being tested right now and it's clearly failing. 
Um, I see some Q and A's and a chat question. Definitely. Um, that's fine with you, Gavin. I think we'll, we'll ask you one or two more questions and then, then we'll go into the Q and A. Yeah, sure. It's not years, by the way. One of the questions is, oh, it'll take years. It won't take years. That's not true. It didn't take years for, 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 for factories here, for plants here to be stood up. It won't take years for those same plants to be stood up elsewhere. So, but it's true that it's not going to happen overnight, but we need to start building these plants now so that by the end of this year, beginning of next year, we're in a much better place. If we don't start that now, it's really hard to see how we manufacture enough doses for the world. Definitely. If, if we want, we can also kind of go back on that question uh, in perhaps yeah. about 10 minutes. But so, so the next question I wanted to ask you, uh, we've already talked a lot about, about some of these, but I want to address them perhaps a bit more directly. Uh, there's been tons of hurdles to vaccinating the majority of a country's population. Uh, there's been administrative uh, incapabilities. There's been the politicization of vaccine distribution, stigmas, fake news. Um, and so we still wanted to understand um, if there's been some countries that have been much better at addressing these concerns. We, you talked a little bit about some countries like South Korea, like, like Vietnam. Um, do you think there's enough communication between countries on what the best practices are to address these difficulties? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there have been, it has been obviously a big challenge in this pandemic, the amount of misinformation out there. And that there's a whole range of misinformation, obviously. There's the sort of snake oil remedies that are being sold online. Um, there's the anti-vax movement, which largely driven by social media, has been given fuel during this pandemic. Um, then you've got world leaders, obviously, Bolsonaro and Trump and others, just saying bizarre things, you know, the, the Trump saying that it's just going to disappear, uh, that you should, that, that ingesting bleach could help, all of these things, you know, basically encouraging people to break social distancing, very unhelpful. Um, I think there's been a, a, a profoundly unhelpful movement around, or a sort of a cult of people thinking that the way forward is through natural herd immunity, not vaccine herd immunity. And I, you know, I try and correct that misinformation online all the time, but it's a very commonly held view. Um, so yes, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Some countries have tried to get on top of it. Um, there has been in the UK, for example, there's a sort of a, a kind of a, a rapid, a rapid science fact checking center. There's one in Taiwan. You will have seen at the University of Washington, Carl Bergstrom and colleagues set up a center for information of science during this pandemic. Um, so there have been this, these initiatives trying to sort of counter the mis mis misinformation. Um, and I know, and again, I think some of the countries that have, that did very well in this pandemic were really good at countering misinformation, at communicating, you know, proven science uh, on distancing, on you know, avoiding crowds, on um, mask wearing, etc. Um, so I think that look. We, we, we absolutely have to learn from this pandemic lessons from what countries did well and what they didn't. Uh, it's very clear that there was a very wide range in performance. We will be studying for years to come, you know, why it is that in some parts of the US, one in 200 people died. In New Zealand, one in a million died. It is not down to luck entirely. Yes, it's an island. There are all those advantages, but it's not entirely down to luck. Um, we are going to need to, to learn the lessons of success and failure and be very honest about those because every country is going to need to have a core set of capacities that is going to have to include the communication of science, um, tackling misinformation, tackling anti-vax misinformation and you know, anti-mask misinformation, all of those things. Um, uh, and, and absolutely, we're going to need a sort of an international way of learning, you know, across across boundaries. Um, so, uh, absolutely, yeah. 
And then touching a little bit more on some of these uh, infrastructure and administrative hurdles. Um, so we we did uh, see that that Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance, uh, announced last weekend that it had secured um, vaccine doses from Moderna to distribute around 500 million uh, mRNA vaccines to countries in need. Uh, however, it there's definitely concerns that because of the need for mRNA to be stored and and, and transported at very uh, low temperatures, that uh, that could be difficult to to basically uh, combine with uh, with countries that don't have this access, easy access uh, to this kind of infrastructure. Uh, how do you think this could impact uh, the viability of these vaccines? And no, the of course. To- I mean, obviously, we you know it, it, there are logistical issues in rolling out vaccines. Um, no one can pretend that there aren't. I think sometimes those get somewhat overplayed. Um, you know, we, the international community has, and countries themselves have distributed vaccines in challenging environments before, Ebola vaccines, for example, um, in places that are very resource, uh, resource poor. Those challenges have been overcome. You know, trials of vaccines requiring refrigeration have been conducted in low and middle income countries. So these are challenges that can be overcome. Um, we will continue to innovate, right? We've got single dose vaccines. We, some of them are two doses. Now we have a single dose vaccine. That's already an innovation that helps to potentially make it easier. We will continue to, this is, if you like, the first generation of vaccines, there will be second generations and third generations. There are nasal vaccines under development, for example, that could be a game changer. There are more thermo heat stable vaccines under development. So I think we're going to continue to, you know, see those sorts of um, innovations. There is a huge debate right now, you've probably seen about, you know, what's the end game for this pandemic? Uh, and I think eradication is off the is off the table. I mean, that would be the most enormous Herculean task. Imagine we've only ever eradicated one human disease, smallpox. And so nobody is talking about eradication right now. But there is a very big question about whether it's feasible for countries to eliminate, as some countries have already done. That is also a large undertaking. Vaccinations will clearly be uh, a key if countries are going to do that. But what it requires, if you take a look at Australia or New Zealand, it requires an incredibly high functioning surveillance system. You need to be able to spot a single case and act fast um, to to dampen down, to, to basically quash any small outbreak. You have to have very good border measures. So everybody coming in, if you find a case, they have to go into managed isolation. You have to be able to manage quarantine. So it's a very intense process. And there's a huge debate right now. You will have seen the big story in the New York Times today on herd immunity and how that, you know, we may not even be able to um, achieve herd immunity here. The debate on elimination is very fraught in the US. You know, we don't have a fantastic national surveillance system that could instantly identify a single case, you know, and uh, squash an outbreak. We don't have border management. So it would be a very heavy lift here. But can we transform this into something with that, that's you know, low endemic levels with very few cases? And if you get it, it's not you know, a high fatality disease. Yes, and that we can absolutely must go for. You know, even if we can't eliminate, we should try because the root, what you're doing in getting there, vaccination and other measures as necessary, you know, is to massively reduce mortality and turning it into a, a disease that even if you've got the illness, it doesn't kill you. And for equity reasons, it's really important to keep striving for that. And one of the reasons that New Zealand, as you know, when, it, when, when COVID-19 first hit in New Zealand, they didn't go for elimination. They, 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 uh, they used a flu playbook, a flu pandemic playbook. And then they realized that there would be a mass death event if they did that. And that w- there would be massive inequity in who died. Falling, for example, on you know, um, income lines, on racial equity lines. And they realized 
that it would be a catastrophe. So that's when that's when they went for elimination. And they, they and the officials there have said that equity was a really important reason why we did it. And it's a really important reason going forwards for why you should obviously try your hardest to reach the lowest levels possible going forwards. All of which is to say, we may need to be having boosters. You know, we may need to have future shots that are adapted for, for variants of concern. You know, the, 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 I think a scenario that many think, think is likely is that this becomes an endemic disease in many countries, eliminated in some, but endemic in others, but maybe you have a regular shot uh, and maybe there are local flare-ups that will require public, the usual kinds of public health measures to, 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 um, you know, to dampen down as we go forward. Now let Mira uh, ask her final question and then we'll move on to the Q&A. Yeah. Um, so the world seems to be operating in two separate realities. You spoke about this already, countries like the US and Israel are celebrating entering a post-vaccine world while people in Delhi and Gaza are basically begging from oxygen. As someone whose family is in India right now, I. I can see the two realities very clearly where people at home are finding difficulties finding hospital beds. Yeah. Um, you read different articles every day about things like that. And everyone out here is living a different, like actually living a different. Yeah. Um, people are describing this, what is unfolding as a vaccine apartheid. Um, I was hoping to get more of your opinion on that. Well, it is. I mean, first of all, I'm really sorry for, you know, for what you're going through um, and for the for the crisis that is happening in India. Um, a third of my own team uh, are Indian and are in contact with their families all day, every day. And, you know, we partner with researchers there, the Public Health Foundation of India, uh, you know, and we're in daily contact and we are all of us trying to do what we can, which is kind of limited. Um, I guess one of the things that I'm involved in is I'm in the information space. And so getting help, helping to get information out as much as possible. Um, and there's been some fantastic efforts on that front. Um, the, the, the reality is that clearly we do have a massively inequitable distribution. Um, the term vaccine apartheid, the director of UNAIDS, Winnie, she came up with that. That's not that that that's her term. I mean, yeah, I think that's the first time we've heard it from her. And some people don't like the use of the word apartheid. You know, I was born under in Cape Town under apartheid, um, and we we left uh, when I was a kid. And, and some people feel that that word shouldn't be used outside of that context, but. I think people get that what we're talking about is that the, the, the Mira, you described it very well. There's the sort of ecstasy of being vaccinated here in the US versus seeing what's happening, you know, in India um, with people literally dying on the streets and, and you know, um, cremations on the streets and so on. Obviously, you know, there's going to be a lot of analysis on what happened. I don't think now is the time, now is, this is a humanitarian catastrophe. I feel strongly that now is not the time, uh, you know, to sort of criticize. There's plenty of criticism to go around. I mean, I wrote a piece, oh God, last summer, I think, with Greg Gonzalez at Yale uh, about populist leaders who, who, who had turned away from science. And at that time, Modi had been sort of clamping down on journalists who were saying anything negative about his performance um and you know as you know earlier this year you know there's been the administration the administration there was quite triumphant about how well they were doing and there were a lot of people nervous about that like is it really i mean is it really the time to be letting up on public health measures and so on? there's going to be plenty of of there's going to be plenty of time to sort of figure out what went wrong and again i don't i think it's extremely important i, I cannot stress how important it's going to be for us as an international community to understand why some countries did well even without vaccines and why some, some countries did poor. we're going to have to learn those lessons now is the time to figure out 
you know, how can communities be empowered to enact public health measures from masking, ideally better masks, you know, higher filtration masks, to distancing, you know, to ventilation, to stay at home, to staying at home where possible, you know, if I think about the team, my own team, you know, their families have, have luckily been able to start working from home, etc. cetera. Um, simple things like opening windows and making simple box fans that don't cost very much money with filters on, all of those things to help to, to, to break the cycles of, of transmission, trying to support implementers as much as possible with oxygen, the basic drugs that are needed, all of those things, trying to support those who are running food banks um, and, and supporting those staying at home, all of those measures while surging vaccines. I mean, the, 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 though vaccines themselves are going to, they, will, they are not instant. They don't provide the, the, the break, if you like, that those other measures that I mentioned did. Um, but clearly we have to surge vaccine as well. That's how the, the, the pandemic is going to end there. And that's how it ended in both the UK and Israel, they had awful surges in the winter. You know, uh, my family is in Britain and it was a winter was a dreadful, horrific time. A surge driven in part by one of the variants, B117, which is probably more transmissible. There's some debate about whether it's more deadly, some somewhat conflicting research on that. But the, the, the surge was in part driven by that variant. And they had a, I mean, it took, Boris Johnson forever, and he was given, I think, very bad advice, you know, not to institute a so-called circuit breaker lockdown, um, and didn't, and that delay is estimated to have, have caused an additional 1.3 million infections. Eventually, clearly, he had to do it, and that stay-at-home order drove, started to drive cases down even before the mass vaccination campaign kicked in, and then the vaccinations accelerated the decline, a sort of a one-two kind of double whammy punch. And, you know, I'm not an expert on India, clearly. I mean, that's just, that's not my domain. I am fully aware that a national lockdown is just, I mean, I know that some, many Indian doctors, Indian experts, public experts are, are, are desperately crying out for one, but the logistics of that are difficult to imagine. If, if there was really strong financial support and really strong food support and all of those things, then sure, but I suspect it's going to need to be more targeted and more localized to where the hotspots are. Um, uh, you know, which is part of the reason why scaling up testing is helpful in identifying kind of where the hotspots are. Um, so it's going to have to be one of these sort of comprehensive, all of the above approaches. Um, and there's a lot of you know, a lot of people who've been um, who've been you know Madhukapai, for example. Uh, and others have been writing um, information sheets in lots of different languages distributed across India, some for, for this, some, for, some for the public, some for doctors, treatment protocol plans for doctors, basic public health measures for citizens and so on. So there has been this kind of, you know, activism and uh, sort of a surge in, in, in people trying to help out. Um, so yes, that inequity has to, uh, you know, is one of the sort of defining, how we, how we meet the challenge of, of ending that inequity, I think is one of the defining moments of our time, really. Um, yes, thank you, Professor. Uh, quickly moving on to the Q&A section, we have a question yeah. from who asks, what is your take on vaccine passports? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, First of all, I think the term itself can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? Um, you know, for some people, it means the ability to travel between countries, you know, only if you're vaccinated. Um, uh, I think that's quite problematic because it's going to, it's going to lead to another kind of global inequity. Um, I mean, let me just give you one very specific example to just kind of bring that issue alive. I mean, maybe it's not the most pressing example, but I mean, it's, it, it's, I think it's just emblematic of where we could be heading if we only allow, you know, vaccinated people to, to move between nations. Let's just say that 
we don't do anything about the current rate of vaccination. At the current rate of global vaccination, it's going to be years before there's widespread vaccination in many low and middle countries, so years. So if, say, the United States says, well, you can only come here if you're vaccinated, then what does that mean for our international partnerships, our international collaborations, our global health meetings? I mean, for, for, a, for a long time, global health meetings in the US were um, meaningless because we had a ban on people with HIV coming. So, you know, HIV positive people couldn't, couldn't come into the country, which meant that a lot of the global health meetings, there are people who we wanted there that couldn't come. Then there was Trump's Muslim ban, which meant that my Muslim scholars and friends and collaborators couldn't come, making these meetings totally meaningless again, excluding you know, um, much of the world. Now we're saying people from most of the world, or at least from you know, a huge number of countries are not gonna, be, not gonna be able to come here. What does that mean? And then you're gonna have this situation where, this is a whole other topic for a whole other meeting, but the whole sort of way in which global health education is often set up with you know rich students from the united states and europe or rich researchers in the united states and europe going into into the field in low and middle income countries that's going to be fine right they're vaccinated off they go there's going to be this awful i worry kind of you know for a, a new form of sort of power imbalance and and, and colonialism around this. so i worry about that on the other hand if you're taking it to mean that there are certain activities that you're not gonna be able to do, say in the United States, because you, because you decline vaccination, I sort of understand that. So Duke, for example, in order to register for class next semester, you have to be vaccinated. And to be honest, I think that's gonna happen across every, pretty much every university. I'll be, I'll be surprised if there aren't holdouts. And there, you know, I'm, I, I'm less concerned about that. And Duke has said, anyone who has not had access to vaccination, bam, we'll vaccinate you day one. So, it, so it, as long as there's no inequity in that, in that, that I do understand. And I do get that. Um, I do understand that. Um, we, I just want to ask before we move on to the next question, do you have a couple minutes extra? To go no, half stop at seven to have dinner with my family and then, you know, get my five-year-old to bed. No extra minutes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, then I'll quickly dive into the last question, which is from Jahan Sher. Um, on the note of mRNA vaccines, which require two doses uh, set up, is there a risk of significant loss to follow up in developing countries where adequate education regarding the functionality of vaccines is felt to be minimal. Is there an argument to be made to target a single dose vaccine for these developing countries? It's a very good question. So look, any time that you can reduce the barriers in healthcare, in resource limited settings, travel, transportation, all of those things, whatever you can do to make things easier, the better. So, for example, one of the biggest trends in international health and global health, whatever you want to call it, has been the integration of services, right? So HIV services being integrated with family planning services, for example. Um, uh, so you have this, this kind of one-stop shopping. If you're going to take time off from work and you're going to travel 20 miles or whatever it might be and pay for your transport and lose money from your job for that day, be there just for this one moment where you get lots of integrated services. So in that respect, of course, a single dose is going to be more, um, you know, may end up being more efficient, more practical, uh, better for rollout than, than two doses. On the other hand, I would say one thing that is really heartening is there was always this worry that with two dose regimes, people are not going to turn up for their second dose. In the real world, that hasn't happened. There's been huge adherence to the second dose. In the UK, it's been, I can't remember, 98 or 99% or something. People are, you know, it's not that surprising. People want to be protected against illness and death. There's a real hunger for that. Amongst those who want to be vaccinated, the adherence to the second dose is very high. Um, so from that point of view, I wouldn't worry too much. I also want to just recount the, the, um, 
the story of antiretroviral adherence, which might, there might be a lesson here for us. I don't know. I don't want to pull, push the analogy too far, but there was always a worry in the early days of HIV. There was this awful sort of neo-colonialist neo racist attitude, I think, that when antiretrovirals came along, it's very common to hear, well, you know, we can't roll out antiretrovirals in poor countries because people won't take their medicines. On time. I mean, it was bullshit, obviously. And it wasn't just bullshit, it was proven to be bullshit. The first studies on adherence, we looked at Kailicha in South Africa versus Boston. Adherence rate, people taking their tablets on time, were higher in some of the poorest places on Earth. And, you know, uh, so I think we, we should challenge our assumptions about you know where vaccine adherence is going to be higher and and lower, um, so there may be some lessons there. I don't know. That's it. Oh wait, there's one more minute. But let's see if there's a short check, short questions. Very di difficult one. This the mandate. I don't know about that. It's a very good question. Um, you know, I, my my hope and my sense is that we're going to be able to have enough people vaccinated that even if we don't reach this technical thing called herd immunity, there will be very little of the disease around. There are some, interestingly, I mean, there are some, I don't, I'm not a lawyer and I don't know, I don't know enough about the law. I'm not answering this in any legal way, but there are, there are some health centers, hospitals, et cetera, who are asking their health workers to get vaccinated, who are mandating it unless you've got a religious or medical exemption. Um, and uh, I completely understand the rationale for that. Um, but but I think most people would say that we are that we are the great hope is that vaccination is going really it's, it's, you know it's going really well in the US it's gone very well in the UK Israel sort of shows where we're ultimately heading if you're a rich nation with plentiful doses life is almost back to normal now uh, very low test positivity very few cases um, uh, very few public health measures left I think I have a friend who just um, who's a medical school there, who's been tweeting out photos, no outdoor masking, I think indoor masking still, but pretty much restaurants at full capacity. So that, I think that's where life is heading. Um, and so I think the, the hope is that with that higher level of vaccination, I think once you get to their levels of vaccination uh, and the disease becomes you know, much rarer, I think that mandates probably are not gonna be necessary. That's it. Guillaume, yeah. Patrick, Mira, thank you for the invitation. Thanks to everyone who joined. Um, and I've got to go now and have dinner with my family. Thank you so much. Sorry for keeping you a little bit over. Great pleasure. Great talking to you. Great questions and excellent Q&A. Um, thank you, doctor. Thanks. Bye. Bye, doctor. Bye. Thank you to everyone in the audience. We'll be putting up the recording very soon. Bye, everyone.